Hello, family. God bless you. I'm Pastor Rich Martinez. Thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Wednesday evening. Um, coming to you live uh, from Community Gospel Church. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we're picking up from a previous series that we were teaching uh, before the whole COVID-19 crisis came out, and we were discussing the study of the New Testament. And uh, what we've decided to do is to pick that back up and call it a walk through the New Testament. And I hope you're able to join me each Wednesday evening where we're going to be studying uh, through, through the, throughout the entire New Testament. And uh, we've already looked at the Gospels, the life of Christ. We looked at how the New Testament was formed, the historical background for the New Testament. Uh, we've looked at the book of Acts. But you can get all of our previous messages uh, on our website at communitygospelnj.com. And if you just go to the midweek Bible study link, you'll be able to have access to all of our notes. Uh, our notes for this evening are there and uh, all of our previous messages uh, with the notes there in the midweek Bible study link. Uh, so we're studying the book of Romans tonight. And uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, get them out. If you have the notes, you can download them um, and you have, them, you have access to everything that I have here. All right, so um, we're studying the book of Romans, and my hope is that you not only learn the theology and the historical background of the different books that we're studying, but also how the Bible applies to us. If it's not relevant to us, then it makes no sense to us. Uh, so God's Word is relevant, and it has to be made relevant to us if we're going to get anything out of it. So I don't want this just to be uh, a historical study. No, I want this to be a life-changing study, something that bears witness with your spirit, something that changes your life from the inside out. All right, will you pray with me and agree with me that God gives me utterance to deliver this message to you? And I just pray that you will just come with a hearing ear and an obedient heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to minister and to teach to these your sheep this evening. Lord, we pray that you would just open our, our hearts, God, to understand and perceive the kingdom of God more clearly than we ever have before. Give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, give us a heart to understand, and give us the will to obey. And do this, Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're studying the book of Romans, and uh, if you notice behind me, you'll see a picture, a painting on the wall that was painted by Diego Rodriguez Velazquez, uh, who lived from 1599 to 1660. Uh, there's not a whole lot about the Apostle Paul, but uh, historians tell us that he was rather short in stature, uh, he was somewhat bald, uh, maybe had a, a long nose, and uh, very powerful uh, individual, perhaps not in appearance, but definitely in character and in spirit. And uh, so I just want you to get a little glimpse of uh, how he's sometimes portrayed throughout history. Uh, but the key to the book of Romans is obviously it's, it's what I have up here. It's Romans chapter 1 verses 16 through 17, uh, where the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I hope that you'll gain a better understanding of that verse by the time we're done with this study. Uh, but that is the main theme and that is the main key to the book of Romans, that, it's the God, that the gospel is about the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's what God did in Christ at the cross taking our sins upon himself, becoming the sin bearer, and, let, and bringing judgment upon his own son Jesus so that we wouldn't have to be judged. And then God took the righteousness of Christ and he imputed that to you and I. And he gives that to us and he declares us righteous in his sight. That's why the, the Apostle Paul says that in it, meaning in the gospel, is a righteousness that is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In other words, you cannot access the righteousness of God. You cannot become righteous any other way except by faith. It's not by works. It's not by thinking it. It's not by uh, a feeling. It's not by anything that you can do of your own merit. You can't earn it. It's received by grace through faith. And that's how we receive his righteousness. And we all need that. And so we'll be talking a little bit about, a little more about that as we progress in our study. 
Um, so I just wanted you to just kind of see what, where, what the key theme is uh, for this book on the book of Romans. And we're going to be making our way through. By the way, our syllabus is also posted there online as well on the same link at the Midweek Bible Study. So you can download that and you can see where we're, where we're at, where we're going to be next week as well. All right. So what's the significance of the book of Romans? What, why, why even study it? Why, I mean, why is it so important? Well, first, let me just say this, that it, it just so happens to be one of my favorite books of the entire Bible. Uh, the book of Romans, and it's extraordinarily important. And so I just put a couple of uh, key figures here for, throughout church history, uh, just what they had to say about the book of Romans, and that'll give you a glimpse into the importance of this book. Uh, John Chrysostom, uh, Chrysostom uh, from AD 347 to 407, he had this to say. He, uh, he used to have someone read the book of Romans out loud to him twice each week. And after hearing it read so many times, this is what he said about Romans. Romans is unquestionably the fullest, deepest compendium of all sacred foundation truths. So he believed that of all the books that were written, that this particular book was the fullest and it was the deepest theological work of the New Testament. And I agree with that because this is a book that deals with the, the sin of humanity and the redemption of humanity. And it, it's really, it's Paul's manifesto. It's a theological masterpiece of the plan of salvation. I mean, you won't find a clearer picture of the, uh, or a presentation of the gospel like you will in the book of Romans. So it, it's worth reading it. And if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Uh, start reading it today. Uh, tomorrow, when you get up in the morning, uh, read it. Read it every day. Read a chapter every single day or read several chapters and, and let God speak to you through it. Uh, we, we all need to hear it. We need to hear it regularly. And if you've already heard this message before, don't, and, and don't, don't despair. Don't feel like, well, pastor, I've already heard all that. I, I know all this. I know that. Uh, listen, God's word is not an ordinary book. Uh, it is a spiritual book that is designed to feed and minister to the human spirit. And so it never gets old. It's never absent of revelation. Uh, you could study this book for several lifetimes and never exhaust the essence of God's Word because it's, it's, it's spiritually fresh. It's spiritually uh, in, intertwined with the life of God because it is God's Word. And his word does not get old. It's not like reading a regular history book. It's not like re reading an academic book. No, this is a spiritual book that is designed to minister and to feed the human heart. And so in that sense, it does not get old. So that's why Peter could say, it's of no trouble for me to write the same things to you. In fact, he says, it's for your benefit. And so what I want to ask you is, is it working in your life? You might, if you say, well, I already know all that, well, good, that may be good, but is it working in your life? Have you gleaned everything out of this book that you need to glean? Let me just make it a little bit more personal. Have you gleaned and have you learned everything that you need to learn from the study of the book of Romans? No, neither have I. And that's why we need to keep studying it and keep reading it. And because every time you do, or as you read it, I should say, God will unfold new revelation to you. So don't approach the Word of God with, with the attitude of, well, I already know all that. I've heard that before. And because then you leave no room for God to minister growth to you. You need to come before it and say, Lord, I may have learned a lot, but I sure don't know everything. And I don't know everything that there is in it. Would you teach me? And you'll be amazed at how God will begin to unfold his word to you and begin to open up new passages of scripture to you time and time again. And I was just thinking the other day about how sometimes pastors struggle for revelation. They struggle for, uh, to gain new messages. And sometimes they'll find themselves preaching older messages. Or, I mean, I, I have done it myself. I have to be honest with you. Uh, but the Lord showed me that if you're having, if you can't find new revelation or new messages to preach and to teach and to feed your flock, and I'm talking to all the pastors right now, if you can't find something relevant to share with your people, perhaps something you haven't taught before, that's just an indication that you have not been spending quality time at the master's feet. Because if you are spending time at the feet of the master, 
He's always going to have something new and fresh to download into your heart and to minister to you. And so it will never get old because his revelation never gets old. And he has revelations and themes and he has many, many concepts to share with you on a regular basis. But we have to just do a better job at listening. And the only way we can really tune in to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to us is if we're spending time with him at the master's feet. So I want to encourage you, encourage all the pastors out there, spend time with the master daily and let him download new information and new revelation to you. If you're having to rely on old messages and old themes and old concepts and trying to dig stuff up or borrow people's sermons, then you may not be listening and you may not be spending that time with him because if you're spending that time with him, I can guarantee you he's going to be talking to you and you're going to have something to share and minister to the people. Praise God. I believe that was for somebody out there. Now, Augustine, from A.D. 354 to 430, he lived, and a uh, great theologian of the church. This is, what, what, uh, this is written about him concerning the book of Romans. He says, Augustine never wrote a full-length commentary on Romans, but his theology was influenced by this letter more than any other New Testament letter. I'm always amazed at the story of Augustine in the garden, and he heard a little child's voice. And that little child was singing these words, tole lege, tole lege, in Latin. And that means take up and read. And sitting next to him was a scroll from the book of Romans. And he picked it up and his eyes went right to Romans chapter 13, verses 13 through 14. And there it talks about, uh, you know, putting off uh, the works of darkness, so to speak. And, but the one verse that stands out is to, but, but to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, or our modern translations would say, clothe yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, and that really was the w- one verse that brought conversion uh, to Augustine. And, uh, and that right there is what just lit him up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to hear that, to hear the very words from the book of Romans, to, to take up and read and to see those words of to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And something miraculous happened to him in that moment. And he became one of the greatest theologians that the, the church has ever had or has ever known. Martin Luther uh, from the Protestant Reformation had this to say. Uh, well, let, let me just read this to you. He says that he formulated his understanding of sin, law, gospel, faith, salvation, and the righteousness of God by conducting an intensive exegesis or interpretation of this letter. And this is what he had to say. He said, This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and is truly the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. So this was a, an extraordinarily, extraordinarily important book to Martin Luther. In fact, um, according to history, he was wrestling with the concept of the righteousness of God from Romans 1.17. And as he was wrestling with it, where Paul says that in, it, in the gospel there is a righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But as he was wrestling with that concept of righteousness, um, he used to you know, approach righteousness as this, that you know, righteousness is something that we have to do, and, and it's, it's, it's based on our, our work, so to speak. But he got the revelation from that verse that it's more of a passive, more of a passive concept, meaning that, revel- that righteousness is something that we receive, and that when we receive it by faith, that's it right there. You have been made righteous in that moment. And he caught that revelation. He caught a glimpse of that. And he said that when that happened, he says, these were his words, that he was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. And he went on later to say that that place in Paul was, for me, truly the gate to paradise. So when he saw that righteousness is something that I don't have to work for, but I can receive by faith, and that I'm now clothed with the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God, I don't have to try to be righteous. I'm, I'm already made righteous. And of course, then we live that out. But that set him free. 
because he struggled with that. And maybe you struggle with it. Maybe you struggle because you're always trying to gain God's approval. You're trying to work for something. You're, trying to, you're afraid that if, if you're not doing the right thing or if you're, you're afraid that, that for somehow, no matter how hard you try, you keep falling short. Well, friends, I have good news for you. There, your righteousness is, is as filthy as rags. There's nothing that you can do to earn righteousness. There's nothing. In your own self, you have no power to live right. That's why you have to receive the sacrifice of Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. And when we do, we receive his righteousness based on his merit, based on his works, based on what he did for us. By dying on the cross and being crucified and shedding his blood for you and I, God imputes his righteousness to us. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says that he who knew no sin, meaning Christ, was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And God imputes imputes his righteousness to us and declares us righteous. So you can relax in that and say, thank you, Father, that I am righteous. And when you do that, grace is there to accompany it, to help you to live out the Christian life. And even if you fall and you make mistakes, God doesn't get mad at you. No, he says, son, daughter, get back up, ask for forgiveness and move forward. And he cleanses us with his blood because it's his blood that cleanses, it's his blood that makes us right before Almighty God. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, but let's go through the, an overview of the book of Romans. And uh, let's just go through just some basics here uh, before we get into more of our main theme on righteousness. And the authorship, who wrote Romans? Well, Romans 1.1 clearly states that Paul is the author. Um, but he didn't necessarily pen it down. No, he had a, what was called an amanuensis, and you can read that in Romans chapter 16, verse 22. Uh, there was a, a fellow that was named Tertius, and he apparently was Paul's scribe. And in fact, he interjects in Romans 16 that he says, I, Tertius, wrote this letter. So Paul most likely dictated it, and then Tertius wrote it down. Um, but it's obviously Paul is the author. Um, all earliest church leaders believe Paul wrote it. So if we go back to early church history, uh, the patristic writers or the early church fathers, as we would call them, uh, such as Ignatius, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, uh, Irenaeus, uh, all say that Paul wrote this letter. And also the Moratorian fragment of about 170 AD states this. But you can go back to some of our previous messages on how we got the New Testament. I talk a little bit more about the Moratorian fragment if you're interested in that. Uh, it was written between 57 and 58 AD. Um, it was written from uh, Corinth, where Paul was stationed at, and I'll look at that in a moment. But before we do that, I want to just take a quick glimpse at uh, who is Paul writing to? What was the audience? What was the audience at Rome? Uh, was it all Jewish people, or were there also Gentiles? Well, first let me just say this. Paul never established the church at Rome. Uh, the church at Rome was already there. In fact, if you go to the beginning of the uh, book of Acts, you'll find that there were visitors from Rome that came and that were there at the upper room. And uh, they were there. And so where uh, God started this whole thing, where the Holy Spirit started all, all of this, there were visitors from Rome. And it's most likely that that's where the church was started and founded, uh, by these visitors from Rome, uh, not necessarily from Peter per se. Although our Catholic brothers and sisters might say it was Peter was the, the founder of this church and all that. Well, if you go back to the book of Acts and you, you'll see that there, was, there were, on the day of Pentecost, uh, there were visitors from Rome. And they heard this message of the gospel and they most likely went back and, and that's where the church most likely got started. Because later on, Paul goes on in one of his missionary journeys and he says, listen, I'm coming to you. And I'm hoping that you'll assist me as I go on to Spain, and, and uh, I hope to have you support me. Uh, so uh, Paul was not the founder. Let's just put it that way for, for now. And, but there were in this place, there were uh, Jews and there were Gentiles uh, that were in uh, Rome. And that apparently, probably most likely founded by Jewish, uh, Jewish believers. Um, in fact, uh, it's believed by many scholars that the original congregation of the Romans was predominantly Jewish initially. That is until there was an expulsion of the Jews or until the Jews were exiled and sent into exile out of the city of Rome 
In fact, um, you can read this in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 2. It says that, that there was a, uh, a, a, basically a riot, if you will. And, uh, well, it, it actually says that there was a, uh, that Claudius, uh, the emperor of Rome, um, it, <laughs> evidently uh, kicked out the Jews. And uh, Suetonius, who was a writer for the Romans, basically said that they were, <laughs> and this isn't in Acts, but it says that they were arguing over one by the name of Crestus. And not Christus, but Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. But it just seems to be a, a variation of the word Christ. <laughs> and uh, so it could be that they were arguing over Christ. And it got into such a heated debate and an argument, and it ended up in a riot, and Claudius kicked out the Jews. And that left a lot of the Gentiles, those that were non-Jewish. It left them there. And apparently, uh, by the time that the Jewish Christians were uh, allowed back into Rome, when by the time Paul's writing, this congregation is predominantly Jewish and Gentile. And it has probably a, a Gentile leadership, and there were certain tensions now that had already evolved and developed between Jews and Gentiles over food laws. And uh, Gentiles are probably saying, listen, we, you know, we've accepted Christ by faith. We don't have to observe the law and these food laws and Sabbath days and circumcision. And maybe there were Jews saying, no, we have to observe the, these food laws and circumcision, and we have to observe uh, holy days and things of that nature. And there was tension there. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 14, he talks about the weak and the strong. You can see the Jewish and Gentile tensions that are uh, prevalent there. Um, so it's fair to say this, that just in a simplistic form, that by the time Paul's writing to the Romans, there's both Jews and Gentiles there. Uh, just like this picture here, you see a little, uh, an older picture of our congregation. We would be considered Gentiles, and then there's also a Jewish population there off to the side as well. Uh, but this would have been kind of like the church at Rome. You have two different uh, people groups, so to speak. And, um, but God bless them. You know, uh, you know God is all-encompassing. He's not, he doesn't exclude uh, certain people groups, so to speak. The gospel is for everybody. It's for, the gospel is for both Jew and Gentile. All right, now you say, well, what is Gentile? Well, Gentile just means that you're not, you're not necessarily uh, well, it means without, you know, someone who is without God, so to speak, or a pagan, if you will. And the Jews were considered to be those with God. So it just became a term over time to, to uh, you know, to talk about non-Jewish people that they were considered Gentiles. And, uh, but the gospel is to everybody. It's to, Jew, to Jews and Gentiles. So let's look at the main theme here of the, of the uh, book of Romans. And it's a very... Uh, looks almost like a convoluted map, but all these different lines and circles. And this really is just a, a, uh, a map of Paul's missionary journeys, his first, second, and third missionary journeys. And then also the green line there actually represents his journey to Rome, and then ultimately he's going to go off to Spain. And Paul was really hoping to get uh, to Rome so that he could find support for his ultimate missions trip, which was going to be to Spain. In fact, if we read from uh, Romans chapter 15, uh, the Bible, he tells us that, that he's planning to visit them at Rome. And this is what he says in verse 23, but now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions. You see, Paul had already been around this whole area called the Illyricum, and he had been down the first, second, third missionary journeys, and uh, he, started, he started over here in you know, Jerusalem, and then he just, he kind of, you know, his churches were established, then there was a second missionary journey, then the third missionary journey, and he kept revisiting uh, some of the churches, strengthening them. So he had been over these areas several times, and then finally, he says, look, I want to get to Rome, and, I want to, and I'm hoping that when I get to Rome here, that you will support me financially so that we can get the gospel all the way to the far western world, which at that time would have been, would have been Spain. So this is what he says here, and he says, uh, since I have been longing for many years to see you, he says in verse 24, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to visit you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. You see, he was hoping to stop off at Rome and then have them assist him financially so that he could go to Spain and spread the gospel. Now, we don't know whether or not he ever made it there or not, 
it, I don't know that he did. I don't know that he didn't. Um, but we do know that he died as a martyr under Nero's reign, executed, uh, beheaded, Roman execution style, um, while he was in prison. So we don't, uh, probably around 62 to 64 AD, I think, uh, somewhere in that vicinity. So we don't know that whether he got there or not. Uh, but his intention was to spread the gospel. And friends, that's what our intention has to be. I mean, that's got to be our mission. That's got to be our focus to get the, the gospel out. Why? Because it's the good news. We're called Community Gospel Church for a reason. The word gospel means good news. And we want to share that good news with you. We want to share it with our neighbors. We want to share it with the world. That's why we support missionaries and all around the world. Uh, because they need to hear the gospel. They need to hear that Jesus died for them. That his blood was sacrificed. And friends, there is no other way. Jesus said that I am the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So he's the only way. He is the only way in the truth. And he's the one that we need to receive as our Lord and as our Savior. He's our sin bearer. He bore sin in his own body. He died with it. He was judged by God for it. In fact, he, he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why would God do that? Why would, why, would, why would Jesus even cry that out? Because God had to reject his son for a brief moment so that he could accept you and me. Jesus was rejected so that you and I could be accepted. Jesus was made sin so that you and I could be impute, receive his righteousness. He received death, a death sentence, so you and I could receive a life sentence. Isn't that beautiful? That's good news. And we'll look at that in a little, de in a little bit more detail in a few moments. But I just want you to see uh, why Paul's writing, what the purpose here is, main purpose for writing to the Romans. Because he wants to get this message as to, to, the, to the known world. To as far as he can get it, get it out to. That's why he says, I, I've already, I've ministered all over this entire area and there's no more, more where I can minister to it, but I want you to assist me so that I can get this out and we can get this message out. And so that's, what, that's the main purpose that he's, he's writing. So, so he, Paul wrote to introduce himself and explain what it is he believes, the good news, with the purpose of gaining support from them for his missions to Spain. And really, what I love about this is that it really resulted in his greatest theological masterpiece, the book of Romans. You see, he's writing to them his theology. He's telling them what he believes. He's talking about righteousness and justification and redemption. And he's saying, hey, this is what I believe. And I hope that you'll support me in my missions to Spain. And that's ultimately, that's his goal. And thank God he wrote it down because you and I are the recipients of that. And we benefit from, from that letter. So that's one of the main purposes. Now, there's other sub-purposes in here. And uh, we could talk about him wanting to heal the rift between the Jews and Gentiles. In fact, he talks about uh, taking up a collection from the Gentile churches and bringing that to Jerusalem to help the, the saints there, the, the Jewish Christians there. And by doing that, he would bring healing between Jews and Gentiles. So uh, there's other sub-purposes you could say as well. But this is the main purpose, all right? So let's take a brief look at the, uh, of the outline of the book of Romans. And uh, this is a real simple outline, something I developed uh, several years ago uh, in seminary. But I thought this was really something that just encapsulates the entire 16 chapters of the book of Romans in a nice uh, encapsulated version, if you will. Uh, but J uh, Romans chapter 1 to chapter 3, uh, I've entitled it Universal Sinfulness and Guilt of Humanity because Paul really lays out this, his theology of sin in these first three chapters to, really just to say that, hey, we're all under sin. Nobody's, nobody's righteous in God's eyes. Jews are not righteous in God's eyes. Gentiles are not righteous in God's eyes. In fact, Paul says in this chapter, I think it's chapter 3 if I'm not mistaken, he says that uh, our righteousness is as filthy as rags. He says nobody's righteous. God's concluded us all as being under sin. So, but what are we going to do? If we're, if we're, if we're sin-bound and we're, sin, we're, we're, we're haunted by this sin nature, 
this fallen nature, this, this, this fall, you know, that, I mean, this fallen world that we're living in. I mean, look, look, folks, don't blame God for what's going on out there right now. Don't blame God for this COVID crisis. If you want to blame anybody, you can blame sin because sin is the reason why this exists. It's the fallen condition of humanity. It's the curse on the earth and things are happening. See, Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus came to give life and to give it more abundantly. But the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the enemy, the devil, because there is a real devil, you cannot have in this world that we live in, if you, you have God, but God is all good, the devil is all bad. And he's taking this bad, this sickness, this disease, and he's spreading it. And at the same time, he's blaming God and saying, this is God's fault. And God has nothing to do with this. This is the work of the enemy who's trying to destroy men's lives, people's lives. And Jesus is saying, I've come to give men and people and women, to give people life and to give it more abundantly. I am actually I'm reminded of when Jesus was trying to uh, head to Jerusalem and he was going to stop off in Samaria and he was going to kind of just, you know, stay there, I guess, for a day or so. But the Bible says that the Samaritans would not receive him. And I think it was James and John who, who said to the Lord, he said, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them because they won't receive you? I'm paraphrasing here. And Jesus looked at them and said, you don't know what spirit you are of. In other words, that's the wrong attitude. James and John, Peter, that's the wrong attitude. He says, you don't know what spirit you are of. He said, I have not come to destroy men's lives. I've come to save them. And that's exact, and that message has not changed to this day. Jesus did not come to destroy us or, or destroy people or put sickness on people. No, he came to save us. He came to redeem us. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Just call out to him. Just say, Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Help me. And he'll do it. But you, you got to do it by faith. Because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is from faith to faith. That's why he says the just shall live by faith. You got to receive this message by faith. And when you do, you'll experience what the Bible calls born again the new birth. It's not just a, a concept. It's not just words. It's, it's a real experience from the inside out. God takes what is dead on the inside, your dead human spirit, and he causes it to become alive. Isn't that beautiful? What the moment you receive Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, Jesus comes into your heart through his Holy Spirit and gives birth to you on the inside and takes that dark heart and makes it a fresh, living, new heart. That's what Ezekiel talked about. That one day, under this new covenant that we have now, Ezekiel said that God would take out the stony heart and put in you a fresh heart, a fleshly heart, meaning a tender heart, a real heart, a heart that is full of the grace and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the new covenant. That's what we have. And all you have to do is accept him as your Lord and as your Savior. And he'll do that for you. Praise God. And when we get to... But look at this. Now watch this. Romans 1 to chapter 3 is the universal sinfulness and guilt of humanity. Paul saying we're all up underneath this sin. But in chapter 3 to chapter 4, it's all about being justified or made righteous by faith, which is what I was just talking to you about just a moment ago. So Paul's saying that the answer to the sinfulness is the righteousness of God. And the way you get the righteousness of God is by faith. And righteousness is being made right. It's being justified. It's the Greek word dikaiosune. It is imputed. It's forensic in the sense that God declares you righteous even when you're not righteous. He says, you are right with me because of the sacrifice that my son made on your behalf. And he declares it. And he decrees it. He declares it. He imputes it to you. 
And that's it. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter what you think about it. When you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're made righteous. He who knew no sin was made to be sin with our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And what do you say, Pastor? What is righteousness? It's right. <laughs> it's being made right. It's justification. Look at the word justification. Just if I never sinned. <laughs> Justified. Just as if I never sinned. Justification. Being made right with God is the ability to stand in the presence of God without a sense of sin, inferiority, or guilt complex, as though sin had never existed. It's called justification. And God gives that to you. And even when you have received it, and you still feel like you're a dirty, rotten, old sinner, you just have to renew your mind to the fact of what God says about you and align yourself with that. Align yourself with the Word of God and align yourself with what He says about you instead of what you think about yourself. That's called renewing the mind. And the more you do that, the more you're going to have that sense of righteousness in you. And that's really what God wants you to have, that sense of righteousness. Not to walk around condemned and, and feeling like you're never good enough. No, that's not God's plan. That's not God's will for you. You have to embrace the fact, step number one, that God has made you righteous. And if he's made you righteous, he wants you to think that way. And, you, and so what you do is say, Father, thank you for giving me your righteousness. Thank you that I'm made righteous according to your word because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And when you have that sense about you, it gives you the confidence then to pray in faith. Because you can't really pray effectively if you're praying from a, a sin consciousness, if you're praying from a guilt consciousness, because you really don't believe God's going to answer your prayers because you're afraid of him. And you have this guilt and you just hope that he's going to answer it. And there's no confidence, there's no faith in it. That's why your prayers are not answered. But when you have this confidence that, Lord, I thank you for who you made me to be in you. I have your righteousness. I can now approach you. You can approach God in confidence. That's why if you go to 1 John, uh, I'm kind of deviating a little bit, but let me just give this to you because I think this will, will help you in your prayer, uh, in your prayer life. But if you go to 1 John uh, 5, 14, it says this, uh, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. You see? He says, this is the confidence that we have in Him. So you can't really approach God if you don't have a confidence. And when you have confidence, you can approach him and you can ask him. And you can say, Lord, I'm asking you to do such and such. So you can ask him according to his will and he will do it according to his word if we ask according to his word, obviously. And uh, so, you know, I, I want you to be encouraged today because, uh, and now I'm looking, I, I don't have it here, but there's also another verse that talks about um, that if our heart doesn't condemn us, then we have confidence towards God and that whatever we ask, we receive of him. But, you know, when you have condemnation in your heart, it's very difficult to receive from him. So, you know, God doesn't want you to be walking around with condemnation and guilt and inferiority because you really can't approach God with confidence when you have that. So we need to start looking at ourselves through the lenses of Scripture and see ourselves the way God sees us. And when we see ourselves the way God sees us, it'll help us to pray confidently. So just a side note, just wanted you to see that. And then, of course, uh, chapter 5 verse to, to chapter 6, uh, Paul talks about being dead to sin and alive to Christ. So he's going to go into the whole process. He's going to compare Adam with Christ. He's going to contrast those two. He's going to say that in, in Adam, we all were dead because of sin, but in Christ, we are made alive because of what Jesus did. And then in chapter 7, it's the triumph of grace over law and sin. Now, chapter 7 is a very, very uh, interesting chapter because it, it, it's, it's almost... Uh, 
how do I say this? It's a stumbling block for some Christians because some Christians get caught up in seven because Paul talks about the, the struggle that when I want to do right, I can't seem to find the ability to do right. And I keep stumbling over my sin. And he's talking about that. Uh, but what Paul's really doing there is he's talking uh, somewhat rhetorically as if he were a individual trying to get free from sin through the law. He's basically saying that it's futile, that trying to obtain freedom from sin by obeying the law, it doesn't work. That's what he's really trying to do in chapter 7. But you got to get out of chapter 7. You can't live there. And you got to get over into chapter 8. Because chapter 8 is being made alive in Christ through the Holy Spirit. It's, in other words, it's, it's, it's how we live victoriously over sin by the Spirit. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying that it's through, this, through the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that makes us free from the law of sin and death. You see, the law of sin and death will try to keep and weigh you down, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it'll set you free from the law of sin and death. So he's saying you got to get out of that chapter 7, trying to obey, trying to keep the law to get free from sin, which doesn't work. It just keep, you keep falling into it over and over. you got to get out of that, and you got to get over into chapter 8, which is obedience to the Spirit, to receive the new life and newness of the Spirit of life. And by yielding to the Holy Spirit, He'll empower you to live victoriously over the law of sin and death, and you'll walk in freedom. That's why Paul said in Galatians 5 that we, that we walk in, but that those who walk in the Spirit will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So when you live after the Spirit, you won't live after the flesh. It's, it's just the way God designed this. All right. And then in chapter 9 uh, through 11, Paul talks about Israel's plan. Uh, he talks about God's plan for Israel, for the Jewish people. Uh, their past, their present, and their future, and how they are also part of the plan of God. In fact, Paul says that the gospel came to us, that we were, we were grafted in, that they are the ones with the promises and the covenants, the Jewish people, but we were grafted in because of their disobedience, so to speak. And God paved the way for the Gentiles to come in. And when the full number of Gentiles come in, God's going to revisit Israel, and God is going to bring them in along with us. And so uh, chapters 9 through 11. Uh, and then chapters 12 through 15 talks about practical Christian living and being submissive to authority and uh, just general uh, Christian practices and Christian living. And then, of course, Paul closes in chapter 16. All right. And lists several people there that, uh, that he thanks. Um, but let's go back. I want to go back for a moment and I want to talk to you about the main theme of the book of Romans. And then we'll have one other slide after this and then we'll, we'll close it up. Uh, but the, this theme again, Romans 1, 16 through 17, this is the thread that runs through the entire uh, New Testament, in my opinion, but particularly through uh, the book of Romans, where Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why wouldn't you be ashamed? And let me ask you a question. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the good news? I hope not. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We ought not be ashamed. Not, don't ever be ashamed. Don't ever be ashamed for what Jesus did for you at Calvary, ever. He says, I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because it is the power of God. Woo, man, I love that. That just, that just gets all over me. He says that it's the power of God. I mean, this book is full of God's power, life-giving power. But power of God for what? He says, for salvation, to save you, to deliver you, to redeem you. Who is it for? To everyone who believes. So it's not just for one type of person. No, it's for everyone who will believe. You don't have to be perfect. God's not expecting you to be perfect to come to Him. No, you come to Him as you are. In your sinfulness, I don't care if you're the worst criminal, there's nothing that the blood of Jesus cannot forgive and cleanse you of. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what crime. I don't care if you murdered 10 people. The blood of Jesus is greater than your crimes. And the blood of Jesus will wash you of your sins. That doesn't mean you don't have consequences for your sins. But He will forgive you and He will cleanse you. And He will wash away your sins. And Paul says it's to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Why to the Jew first? Because those, were God, those are God's people. 
Those were the ones who were given the covenants, the promises. And then he says, and, to, and, to, and also to the Greek. In other words, God said, I'm not leaving anybody out. It's for everybody, Jews and Gentiles alike. For in it, in what? The gospel is, the right, verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. In the gospel is the righteousness of God. God died for us on a cross. His name was Jesus so that he could impute and give us right standing with himself. And then he says, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So the good news is the dominant theme which is directed at each of us. God in Christ has made it possible to overcome the terrible and deadly power of sin and to enter into an intimate and eternal relationship with God. Folks, you cannot get free from sin apart from the Spirit of God. You cannot get free from sin apart from the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that destroys the works of darkness in your life and sets you free. His redemption. And why is it bl His blood so important? Because He was sinless. He had no sin in Him. And, it's his, and the Bible says that the life is in the flesh. The life of the flesh is in the blood. It's in the blood. And his blood is what cleanses us and forgives us. That's why I talk a lot about the blood. Because the blood of Jesus is precious. And it's the only thing that can redeem us and save us and set us free. Now, we're going to close on this slide. And I want you to uh, follow this with me because this is really important. And uh, this is a chart that I've developed many years ago, and it's all on the theme of righteousness. I'm still talking about righteousness. Really, what is righteousness? And, or what, what's the full picture or full breadth of righteousness and right standing with God? Well, I have three different columns here. Off uh, on the left is what we would call before the fall, and then the middle column is the result of the fall, the fall of Adam. And then the, off to the right would be God's plan for humanity or the post-fall, or post-Christ, so to speak, if you will. Uh, this is talking about what Jesus has done for us. So this first column is really talking about um, what Adam's life was like before he fell into sin, and then what Adam's life looked like after he sinned, and also that involves us as well. It's basically uh, where you and I have, have lived and spent our life in sin and in the crux of it, but when Jesus came, this, goes to sh this shows us our potential. This shows us of what is available to us when we receive Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. And this is really what this is here. It's a restoration of what Adam had before he fell. So let's just look at this uh, briefly. Um, just keep this in mind. So Adam... The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that Adam was created in the likeness and in the image of God. And so he was created in righteousness. And he had the, he had the uh, communicable attributes of God, if you will. He, was, he had uh, the life of God in him. He had fellowship with God. God had given him authority. He had given him, well, we could call it health, if you will, because there was no sickness, right? So he was in a complete state of health or healthy living. Uh, he had victory or success. Everything he put his hands to do, it just excelled. I mean, there was no curse. There was no poverty, none of that. Uh, he, he had the love of God in him. He walked in that love, and, and, this, and Eve as well. I'm just using him as a generic right now. J joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, uh, humility, self-control, the favor of God, the prosperity of God. Of you, It was all Adam had it all. He had it all until he fell. Until Satan tempted him and Eve and he partook of the forbidden fruit that God told him that when the day that you eat of this that you will die and he died spiritually first because he didn't die physically to, for 900 years. So he died spiritually, just like that light just went out. That's what happened to Adam's spirit. The light just, it went out. <laughs> when he partook, when he disobeyed God. To see, sin lodged in his heart, and he gave birth to sin, or if you will, 
what was all good in him and all those things that God had given him, they, they died in an instant. In fact, I like to look at it this way. The life of God that was there became spiritual death when he sinned and he disobeyed God. His fellowship with God that he had, he became separated from God. And when you have separation from God, you experience what's called spiritual death. That's really what spiritual death is. It's to be cut off from the life of God. To be absent from God is to experience spiritual death. He had authority. God said, I give you authority to tread and trample. He said, you know, over the, over the fish of the sea, over the, every creeping thing. He had that authority. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's the word radah, which means to tread and to trample. He had that authority. He could have trampled on that serpent that came into that garden, but he didn't do it. And when he yielded himself to Satan, he became subject to Satan and he fell into bondage. So that he lost his authority and he fell into bondage and he fell into darkness. And what was once considered healthy living gave birth to sickness, you see? All these things, see, sickness and all these things, they didn't just come about accidentally. No, it, 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 it had a source. There was an original good, healthy condition to humanity until Adam sinned, and that healthy condition was perverted into sickness and disease. And that's what happened. His victory and success became failure and defeat. Love turned to hate. Joy turned to sorrow. Peace turned to torment. Patience turned to impatience. Kindness to harshness. Goodness to evil. Faith to unbelief. Humility became pride. Self-control became self-indulgence. Prosperity became poverty. See, it's just the reciprocal of these qualities. These qualities are not new. They were, they were all good and then they were perverted. And these are the things that humanity became encompassed with and bound by because of Adam. And this is what distorted the image and likeness of God right here, the sinfulness. It distorted it. But God said, I'm not going to give up on my creation. I've got a plan, and his name is Jesus. And I'm going to send him into the earth. And, I, and he's going to take all this bad sin, and he's going to bear it on himself. And I'm going to judge my own son. And he'll cry out on the cross to me one day and say, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, God judged his own son Jesus, turned his back on him for a moment so that he could turn his, his eyes towards us, towards me and you. And Jesus died with our sin. And the Bible says he was made to be sin. Can you imagine that? You, you read it over in uh, Isaiah. It talks about that his image and his, was so marred and distorted beyond any form of man. Well, what could do that? Sin. God took all of sin, all of humanity, and he put it on Jesus. And he became the sin bearer. That's why Jesus had a hard time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's why he sweat drops of blood. That's why he said, he said, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, he said, take this cup from me. Meaning he was going to have to drink the cup of sin on the cross That was, and become sin. It says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin. He was made sin, folks. And that's why, and he had never been separated from his heavenly father for eons of time and this is going to be the first time he's going to be he's going to be separated from his father and practically put into the hands of satan if you will made a sin a sinful and sin being put on him so to speak and that sin is what marred and distorted him and god judged it but jesus never sinned so he was not a sinner <laughs> And that's why death could not keep him. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him because he had never sinned. And God said, I'm going to raise him up three days, three nights in the heart of the earth, the Bible says. And he said, I'm going to raise him up. And he raised Jesus up. Woo! Glory. <laughs> he raised him up and he seated him at his own right hand. And he offers to you and I this righteousness. And he says, I'm going to get back 
What Adam lost in the garden, I'm going to get it back for you. And Jesus got it back. You see? Now when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, guess what? We go from death to life. We go from being separated from God to being having fellowship with Almighty God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We go from bondage to having now authority once again. We have authority over the enemy. We have authority. Jesus said, in my name shall they cast out devils. He said, I've given you authority to tread and trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. That's Bible. Sickness to health. Yeah, that's exactly right. We don't talk about it enough, folks. But Jesus has made available healing to us. In fact, Isaiah 53 says, With his stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 says, By whose stripes you were healed. Healing is in the atonement. He made it available. We can have it. We just have to receive it by faith. But that's a message for another time. And we'll get into that at a later, in a later message, I'm sure. Uh, what was once failure now, victory has been restored. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. When we, we, when we receive Jesus as Lord and as Savior of our lives, we receive the right to be victorious through our faith. In fact, Romans chapter 5 says it this way. I, I, I love this, this verse. I'm closing soon, so don't go anywhere. Romans chapter 5 says this. Verse 17, For if by the trespass of the one man, meaning Adam, death reigned through the, that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Just as one man brought death, Jesus, through his grace, brought the gift of righteousness. This is, folks, this is righteousness. We've been made right. We, we can reign in life through Christ. We can have the life of God, fellowship, authority. We can walk in divine health. We can walk in victory. We have the fruit of the Spirit restored back into us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, humility, self-control. God's... God, God wants to, to favor you, give you his prosperity, give you his health, give you, give you new life. It's all found in what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. It's almost as if God said, I'm restoring back to humanity what Adam had lost. What Adam once had, Jesus says, and Adam lost, Jesus got back for us. It's a recreation, a re-restoration, if you will. I think it's one of the most awesome things. It's what Jesus did for us. And now we're not home yet. We're not in heaven yet. We know, so we only have what, what theologians call the already, but not yet. You see, we're already redeemed, but guess what? We're still going to die in our physical bodies. We're not there yet. When we get to heaven, we'll get new glorified bodies, just like Jesus' body. I wish I had time to go into that, but I don't. So friends, I just want to encourage you. Be encouraged. God is on your side. God loves you. Jesus paid a great price for you at Calvary, at the cross. And all you've got to do is receive him as Lord and Savior, and this will be your inheritance. And you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. All you have to do is say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And God will impute to you Jesus' righteousness. Jesus will make you right in his eyes through his shed blood, through his sacrifice. And you just receive it by faith. You see, friends, you don't have to try to get the life of God when you receive Christ. He gives it to you automatically. When you receive him, he says, you have now have life. When you, re when you uh, receive Christ, he says, now you have fellowship with me. Now you have my authority. Now I make you healed. That's why Peter said, he said, by his stripes you were healed. He was looking back at the cross. By his stripes you were healed. Healed by the cross. Victory belongs to you. You're already more than a conqueror. You just have to, friends, just agree with the word of God. Say this with me. Say, I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say this with me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Say this with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say this with me. For he who knew no sin was made to be sin with my sin that I might be made the righteousness of God. God bless you, family. 
Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. We thank you for this wonderful message that you brought us tonight. Lord, I pray, God, for each of those that are listening, that, God, that, the, that this word will go down deep in their hearts. Lord, bless your people right now. Make it real to them, Lord. Make it real. And Father, I pray that you bless them, make your face shine upon them, grant them your shalom in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, family. Don't forget to join me Sunday morning, 1030 a.m. for our live worship service. And until next time, God bless you. I'm Pastor Rich.